All right. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, good to see you all again here. Uh, we've got 42 people on here, and we usually get a bunch online. So let me start out by, by introducing myself. My name is Eric Rice. I'm the Chief Growth Officer here at King Operating. Um, this is an educational workshop, a macroeconomic overview and geopolitical overview, uh, not necessarily designed to discuss you know, our fund or, or and promote anything solely, solely, purely educational. Uh, we want to be able to use this time. I do a podcast, uh, so I keep up with all, all this news and information, and I just kind of like doing it. Uh, I feel it's kind of my calling uh, or a service that I can provide to mankind to take in a ton of information and break it down into a way that maybe you've never heard before. Um, but the, but the, the real key, the real core behind me doing these things uh, is I want people to make all around the world to make informed decisions in a very ill-informed world. Uh, we keep hearing the terms misinformation, disinformation, fake news. All, it's all real. Um, it's all very real. You are living in the middle of an information war that uh, starting next week, I'm actually going to start documenting all the examples that I see on a daily basis, which are it's overwhelming uh, to see the reality of the world and then what they want you to think the reality of the world is through media. Uh, so you do live in that. Unfortunately, we are in a, a, an information war, an economic war of grand scale that many people are not talking about in those terms, but it's very true. And I try to do these things. Uh, these are my, my, my opinions, not the companies. This is, this is totally on me. Um, so if you hate what I have to say, um, I apologize, kind of, uh, but I will always tell you the, the truth and what I'm seeing. Uh, I may be wrong. Certainly, I'm a human being and, and very capable of being incorrect. Uh, so I try to keep this based on factual events, historical factual events, uh, current factual events. And I really want you to come to your own conclusion. I think that this entire market, the entire world needs a baseline of, you don't need my opinion. You don't need, you definitely don't need Jim Cramer's opinion. Uh, but you, you, you don't need anyone else's opinion. We're all, we're all critically thinking adults. And if we have factual information, uh, we can come to our own conclusions and make our own decisions in our lives and really empower ourselves to, 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 to do great things in our own life. Um, so that is kind of the purpose and the premise behind these educational workshops. So thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to hop into it today. There's a lot of stuff to cover. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not as prepared as I normally am. I've been out on meetings uh, and not near my, my information sources for many days at this point. Um, so I have had, some, I had a chance to, uh, to prep beforehand, but I'm generally pretty well informed along the way. Any of you who know me personally know that I generally know stuff before everyone else, um, or at least have thought through it. And I think one of the things that right now we can discuss that's of, of very strong importance is, is the Fed rates uh, that just paused. Um, now, the media is going to tell you that the Fed paused, which is signs of weakness. And that's not true. Um, the reality behind our country, well, that'll be my opinion. Let me give you factual information. Um, we use the term incompetent. We use the term uh, stupid uh, to describe our leaders in this nation because everything they're doing goes against the will of the people. Uh, and that's factually true. Now, if we continue to think in those terms, I think that we're gonna find ourselves being led down a very, very bad rabbit hole. And I think it's time that we accept the, the reality behind this, that they're not incompetent, that they're not stupid. They're following a plan that's counterproductive to your own life. Um, and, they're, and that's not coming from my opinion, that's coming from their actions. Uh, so we see, when we see the actions of our, of our government, our, our leaders, uh, and, and how that boils down into our lives, it's, it's, it's inconceivable that anyone's that stupid or that blind to the needs of, of the American people. And there is poll after poll and stat after stat that backs that up. And I'm sure if you're listening to me right now that you're probably feeling the same way. And I think it's, I think it's very pertinent at this point in time to start realizing that we live in a world of moves and counter moves. We live in a world where we're watching an old guard be destroyed um, and they're destroying themselves. And if we, if we take a look at the world from where it is, we have to understand that the, the, the Federal Reserve is nothing more than a money, money printer. That's all they do. And they are completely adherent to the economic masters of the world. They will do as they're told. So the, the Fed pausing rates today you know, should be a good indicator for the stock market. However, the stock market itself dropped 234 points after a rate pause. That's very unusual. So why is that happening? Well, a couple of things. Number one, you'll probably hear on CNN or even Fox, no different than there, there's none of them are different. Like they're all they're all owned by the same companies in the end. But there you're going to hear from them. Like, wow, this is a really great thing. The, the Fed is easing back. They're becoming dovish, not hawkish. 
uh, that is horse pucking. Um, Powell came out and said today that we are pausing rates. There's a headline, there's articles for someone. But we see at least two more rate hikes this year. And we cannot foresee rates declining. We cannot see dropping rates for the next couple of years. So what does that mean to all of us? Well, first, first and foremost, it means that we are going to find ourselves in a higher interest rate environment for quite some time. Uh, that's something to accept as reality, and it should be. Uh, to be all, to be honest with you, I'm not actually not upset with this uh, decision by the Fed. I think it had to be done. Uh, America has become our 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 drug of choice as Americans has been cheap money. So just as a heroin addict who has tons of heroin and all of a sudden his dealer leaves town for a couple of days, Americans will go through withdrawal of lack of cheap money. Uh, we have been in a zero interest rate environment for well over a decade. And current interest rates, though they seem very high, they're very destructive to the real estate industry and many other leveraged industries, uh, even to every industry. Like, let's just be honest, because all American companies have gotten used to cheap, cheap capital. So if we find ourselves in this environment, we have to look at it from our own lives and our own perspective. If, if money is going to be expensive, let's, let's take care of our money. Like That's very important. Now, if interest rates are still going to remain high for the next couple of years, that indicates a long-term cycle of quantitative tightening, meaning they're trying to raise rates to pull money out of the system, to decrease, decrease inflation, theoretically. So from a theoretical standpoint, our Federal Reserve, their purpose with the interest rate hikes is to decrease inflation. Is that going to work? Absolutely not. It all begins if you go back to the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act. By its name, sounds amazing. In its actuality, is destructive. So our government loves to give stupid, horrible things, fancy titles that because most people just read headlines or they just see a, a, a brief snippet on something and think they understand it. But if you read six, seven paragraphs deep, you get the real information and understanding. The Inflation Reduction Act, which, they, which every liberal in the world touts is the greatest thing ever because it's named the Inflation Reduction Act, by itself was an act of hypocrisy. In order to reduce the inflation, we must print $1.7 trillion. And most of that will go towards green energy and the destruction of fossil fuels. So in its very core, its very existence was by nature hypocritical at best. Moving forward, since that time period, we've printed ungodly amounts of money for Ukraine. We've, we've printed ungodly amounts of money for two other acts that have gone through Congress and the Senate and been approved by the president. All of these things print money. So as the Fed raises rates and continues to print money, the likelihood or the odds of defeating inflation become next to none, which is why they're now saying we're not targeting 2%, we're targeting 3% inflation. But the real story behind what's happening with all of these things is can you trust the information that they put out? Uh, I'll give you a few examples. And like I said, over the next coming months, uh, I'm hoping I can get some time. We're very busy here right now. Uh, almost didn't have time to do this today. But as we, as we get through this time frame, I'm gonna start just take, keeping, this, keeping this little notebook right here. I'm gonna start looking at, at information that's coming out that, that you should be questioning. Now I question it, that doesn't mean you have to. You certainly should think for yourself. I'm, not trying, to get you to, I'm trying to get you to think critically, not think like I do, just think critically on your own. You know, the, the information that they put out, right? So the, the Federal Reserve trying to raise rates to lower inflation while Congress passes bill after bill after bill passes a new debt ceiling restructure that didn't really do anything. It reduced some spending in some areas. But if you look at our government spending, I have the numbers here. You know, we, we essentially spend $6.2 trillion a year. as a go Our government is way too large. Uh, the largest employer on planet Earth is the United States government. It's the largest organization in the world, the government, not, uh, not a private business, the U.S. government. Uh, they have a, a budgetary need of about 6.2 to 6.4 trillion dollars a year, and they collect anywhere between four and 4.5 trillion in taxes. So the the ruling authorities of our lives are literally the worst investment you could ever make. Um, you know, it's a it's a it's a great business model on the revenue cycle, right? The United States government collects 30 to 40 percent of everyone's income. Yet after years and years and years, they're they're approaching 35 trillion dollars in debt. I mean, as an investor, would you put money into a company that collects 40% of everyone's income and is still, you know, 30 plus trillion dollars in debt? Of course you wouldn't. Uh, but they'll keep selling you that they're doing the right thing, right? Like giving money to Ukraine or giving money to whoever or a LGBT organization, that these are good things for the, for the world. Uh, and they may be, I don't know, that's your, it's your perspective. Uh, my perspective is they're a waste of money. 
Uh, I don't really care about the, the end game. But if we look at what's happening right now, Janet Yellen actually told the truth. Uh, the, I wish I had a bell to ring. You know, we, we, have a, we have a truth moment from Janet Yellen. Uh, she actually said three days before the debt ceiling negotiations that America faced an economic catastrophe. Um, she's correct, but there's absolutely nothing that Janet Yellen or the Federal Reserve or any politician in, in government can do to fix it at this point in time. It's, it's so bureaucratic and so just so much of a system and a machine, there's nothing we can do, but she did say it. Now, she never corrected her statement after the debt ceiling negotiations. So let's kind of keep this thing focused in. Whatever, the, the real purpose of, of, of this conversation today is I want you to start questioning the information you see. Uh, great example was just you know no more than three hours ago. Uh, the Fed comes out and pauses rate hikes, but the market goes down. What does that tell us? Well, you have, you'll have your own opinion. My opinion is that the market doesn't believe the BS that's coming out of the government anymore. Um, we can look at the jobs report. Great information on that. I've been talking about this for a very long time. And, you know, use your eyes to determine what the reality is, not the information being given to you by a bureaucrat. Matter of fact, at this point in time, if you, whatever information comes from a bureaucrat or Jim Cramer, you're going to make a fortune doing the exact opposite. I mean, that, that's kind of a proven fact in 2023. Um, but it's very interesting at this point in time to look at the jobs, just the jobs report, because I'm going to get into the EIA and how they're affecting oil and gas prices, which is something we're all, you know, in. But if we look at the jobs act, the jobs reports that come out, the most recent jobs report said that 499,000, 399,000 new jobs were just created. Very interesting thing to look at is that they have now beat, this is the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the United, the United States, your taxpayers pay for these statisticians uh, to be the best at their job. That's where your tax dollars go. They're so good at it, by the way, that they have now beat their own estimates for job creation 14 consecutive times. 14 consecutive times, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has beat their own projections. They have destroyed and slaughtered Wall Street's projections, who, by the way, whatever you think about Wall Street, they have more money than the government like to apply towards data. They have better data, they have better statistics, they have better access to information. And the BLS has destroyed Wall Street's job creation estimates and their own 14 consecutive times. So if you put that into a mathematical perspective, that is a one in 16,000 chance that that happens. I'm gonna repeat that. The BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has beat their own job creation estimates 14 consecutive times, which has also beaten Wall Street's estimates for job creations. That is a one in 16,000 chance. So either our government won the lottery or they're probably not telling us the truth. But either way, that decision is up for you to make. I don't believe they're telling us the truth. But why would they do such a thing, Eric? That seems so contradictory. We're the government, we're here to help. Um, maybe they're not. Uh, if we look at how these reports work, if you look at how a job creation or a BLS statistic breakdown works, when they come in and give us the jobs report. Now, I, I used to be in, in, in the whole Wall Street stuff when I was younger. And the jobs report every month was something you had to pay attention to because the market would move immediately. Now, here's how it works. The Federal Reserve relies upon the BLS and their statistics to determine their next move. OK, keep that in mind. Then what happens is the jobs report comes out, the Federal Reserve gets it, they make deci economic decisions that determine your future, and then they make decisions that have to be revised two months later. So of these 14 consecutive job estimates beating, having beat their own estimates 14 consecutive times, a one in 16,000 chance, uh, almost every one of these jobs reports has been revised two months later. So in, in a non-conspiratorial way, uh, we have to at least accept right now, that 14 consecutive, beating your estimates 14 consecutive times followed by, I don't know the exact, it's either 12 or 13 revisions two months later means maybe they're not as accurate or as, as good as they claim to be. Uh, and I've talked about this in every one of these workshops is that it's important to follow government information as an investor, or even, even just as a, as a, as a father, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a patriot, as a citizen in this country, you have to follow it because uh, these types of, of situations will impact your life, whether it comes down to being more expensive at a grocery store or uh, your kid not getting into college or maybe not getting a mortgage. You know, I'm 46. I have no problem admitting that in real life. Um, so that's how old I am. 
uh, I, my, my prime is, is pretty much past. I, I, I do these things because I'm concerned for the welfare of my two children and all of your children. I'm, I'm concerned that if we become such a trusting society of government information, which dictates our entire world, that we're gonna find ourselves in a position we never dreamed of, and they're gonna be far worse off. You know, if we look at how, how, how these things affect us, you know, just the interest rates not dropping or rising, pausing, we look at inflation and where it's headed, we look at global warfare, we look at all these other things. Uh, we also look at, at, at people in Congress celebrating, a, a, we, we work together and we got another $4 trillion will be printed between now and 2025. This is a big win because we need $6.2 trillion to run gender studies programs in Alabama or whatever they're doing. And just, we, we just have so much fat in our budget as a government. If we look at our children, you know, I have a 14 year old and a 10 year old. And, uh, and I'm, I'm very concerned that when they, when they turn my age, that our federal deficit will be $150 trillion, uh, an inconceivable amount. Uh, I'm concerned that they hopefully will be more successful than my wife and myself. That's the whole purpose of being a parent. But I'm concerned that they may be more successful, yet they won't have anything to show for it. Because what's coming with a federal rate hike pause, with high inflation, with confusing, if not misleading, government data coming out of the out of our, our government, uh, I'm 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 very convinced that we are going to see a, a, a tax hike very soon. Um, there is nothing more important in in your financial portfolio right now. Don't worry about you know how do I trade and make six percent a month. Worry about how you pay less tax. I'm concerned that my children will end up in an eighty percent tax bracket. You know, and, that, and that's kind of the, the collision course that we're on as a nation. And it all comes down to the fact that everyone in this country is just kind of far too busy to pay attention to the things I do. That's why I do these things. Um, so I'm going to get into this uh, in the end. I'm going to kind of summarize this and wrap it up for you. But I think it's important to understand that the jobs report may not be accurate. Uh, I've said it for a long time. I'm convinced of it. I actually spoke at a university about this, and I only had one person question it. Um, and they didn't question it after 10 minutes alone with me. But you want stats, their stats, 14 consecutive, beat their estimates 14 consecutive times. It's a one in 16,000 chance. And almost every jobs report is revised two to three months later. Uh, I have stated before that there is the Philadelphia, head of the Philadelphia Federal Reserve quit his job because he said, we didn't create a million jobs in 2021. We created 10,000, but we were told to tell you a million. Uh, so that is happening. Um, that is happening. It's also happening with the EIA. You want to play a fun game, your oil and gas investors. Here's a fun game of... Uh, uh, having a, a cramp in your stomach all day long. Every time oil goes up, it's just a, a interesting coincidence, I suppose, although I don't actually believe in that word. Um, it, is, it is astounding the accuracy. Every time oil goes up, call it $2 or, or three and a half, four percent in a day, which it should be doing regularly based on actual supply and demand. Every time oil goes up, miraculously, the EIA, the board that the government chose to publish inventory statistics of petroleum. Uh, miraculously, within 24 hours, a whole new inventory build is created. Oil goes up, put on information, there's too much supply, oil goes down. Uh, I'm not saying boldly, directly, that things are being manipulated. That's up for you to decide. Uh, watch, watch with me. It's, it's pretty interesting. You can share with your friends. It's like an interesting game of clue that exists on a daily basis. Um, this stuff happens with natural gas. It happens with gold and silver. Uh, this stuff happens all the time. Gold and silver, great topic we're going to go into. Uh, but I'm going to go into it in just a moment because I think it's important to preface uh, what I'm about to share with you today. Um, I have talked for at least three months to all of you uh, about the potential of de-dollarization, uh, which is the removal of the uh, United States dollar as the global reserve currency. I've been talking about this for about a year on my own outside of work, and I have been called stupid and crazy and, of course, a conspiracy theorist by many economists. Uh, I would say 60% of them uh, are either have or will apologize soon, and 40% of them will never believe anything because they believe that we're still in like 1957. <laughs> In, in the year 2023, we have to acknowledge our reality. The reality is that the government we have, the government we have in control of our lives right now has really no interest in your economic uh, safety, your economic, your safety in general, to be honest with you, but they have no interest 
in, in, in creating a nation that's stronger tomorrow than it was today. Um, that's kind of a nice way to say it. Um, so here's what's happening around the world. And I think this is very important when you have Janet Yellen, debt ceiling, de-dollarization. There's so many things swirling around the world right now. I am going to start doing these things weekly. Um, and we actually have a podcast studio in office now. So I'm going to be doing a daily uh, economic update of news, uh, 15 minutes. It'll be very short and you can listen to it in your car, it'll be on iTunes, all that stuff. Um, but I think it's very important to understand what's truly happening outside of the United States because the hardest information to get from mainstream media is what's happening around the world without their opinion or spin on it. And here's what's happening. If we look back at the history of the US dollar, so we be, basically became the global reserve currency in the 40s after World War II. We were kind of granted this autonomy of strength around the world. There's World War II is a fascinating time in history. And if it was outside of King, you could listen to my podcast and understand some things you may not have heard about. Um, but the reality is we became a global reserve currency. Now, very sneakily, over the course of period a period of time, so let's call it like late 40s, we became the global reserve currency. By 1971, we decided we were the global reserve currency because we were a gold-backed security. Like that's what our currency was. It's still considered a very strong store of wealth, but maybe not in the future. Um, now, going through history, we have 1971, we removed the gold standard. And a couple of years later, we created the petrodollar. So when it's not backed by gold, but it's backed by oil. So how could you back it by oil when at that time, we were a very low producer of oil compared to the Middle East. So we created a pact with Saudi Arabia and said, hey, listen, in order to remove the gold standard and basically create a pure fiat currency, we're going to say that it's a petrodollar backed by oil. And we need your support to do this because you're the largest exporter in the world, Saudi Arabia. And in exchange for this power that we will create for our country, we will use all of our power and military might to, to make sure that you're safe. You know, at that period in time, Saudi Arabia was excessively wealthy compared to the other surrounding nations in the Middle East. They were hated. So at a time where war was really brewing, you had the Iran you know, stuff happen in the late 70s, very volatile part of the world for most of our lives, uh, if not eternity. Um, but if we look at that period in time, that was a very unstable time in history. And times of instability create times of new power. So the new power that was created during that time is we went to Saudi Arabia and said, hey, all the oil runs through you. Make sure everyone uses the U.S. dollar and we'll make sure that we watch your back. That was the pact that was created. That pact is now gone. Uh, it is far gone. And some of the things that are really interesting about this that I'm going to walk through kind of more historical today than, than current news, because current news hasn't really changed much in the last three or four weeks. It's all the same story just being repeated and, and embellished over and over again. Uh, now, one of the things that's really interesting is that this late 40s through the 70s, the petrodollar created tremendous wealth and abundance and power for the United States, it really did. I mean, that was a game changer. Look at the 80s and the fast movement. We had high interest rates, but we had high incomes. Now, you look at the 90s, the tech boom going through the 2000s. You know, now we're in a very volatile period in history. Again, this is all, no, there's nothing new under the sun. It all repeats. But during this very tumultuous time. Uh, we are seeing things that you will not hear about on any mainstream TV. You could, uh, except for they fired Tucker Carlson. He's the only person on regular TV that has ever talked about any of this stuff. Uh, and I will, I will throw a plug out for Tucker Carlson. He's doing his show on Twitter for free. Um, they're still trying to sue him because he's talking, giving his opinion to people. That's kind of the government we live in. Uh, now, the interesting thing is we kind of fast forward this. So for for years and years, uh, I'll give you an example of Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi, we were told, is like the most evil guy in the history of the world. Well, there's three things that he did that probably ended up getting him killed. Number one, he wanted to eliminate big pharma. He said that the same people who you know, create the disease sell you the solution. He didn't want a central bank in his country. Uh, and he was adamant about creating a gold-backed dinar. Uh, all of those three things ended up being his demise. Back in those days, the United States was so powerful and a military might that if you went against anything that, that we or our allied nations wanted uh, from our government perspective, um, you just got destroyed. Uh, and that, that's history. You can, you can research any of that you like. Then we move into kind of the new Gaddafi, which is Putin. Whatever you think of him, I'm just giving you information. I, I have no, I don't like, I'm not a cheerleader. I don't like that. I love that person. I, I just look at facts. I love my family. I love God. Those are the two things I love. And I 
one 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 thing I follow is our Lord. Um, now we look at let's look at, at at the Biden administration in Ukraine, Russia, because all we hear about is the war and the the, the people and all the you know all this stuff. Well. About 65 days ago, documents were released or leaked from our government that stated two very important things. Number one, the, the first piece of, of, of this information basically stated uh, that Ukraine is getting destroyed. Um, it's about a seven to one ratio Ukrainians dying versus Russian soldiers. Um, let's take that for what it's worth. That has nothing to do with this. Uh, in our conversation about the economy, the thing that was really, really damning to me is the fact that it stated that our government currently knows that 32 nations are laundering Russian oil through Saudi Arabia. Uh, that should immediately trigger a governmental response to shut that down. Nothing has been done. Why was that done in the first place? Well, uh, something most people don't know is that when that war began, uh, number one, Russia didn't invade Ukraine. They were invited into the Donbass who wanted to be liberated. That's a fact. Uh, hate me if you want, CNN. On top of this, we at that point in time decided that instead of, instead of using military might to support a nation that may, may or I don't, like, I don't live in Ukraine or Russia, I don't know, but maybe they want to be you know, freed. Maybe they want to be, and I, don't, I have no idea. What I do know is that when a foreign war broke out, Ukraine is not part of NATO. Uh, Ukraine is not part of any global organization that we have any real true allegiance on paper with, but we've been defending them vigorously. And as part of this defense for a foreign country who's sucking money out of our tax dollars left and right, uh, one thing that our government did was we weaponized the US dollar. There, there's no way around sugarcoating that. We weaponized the US dollar through sanctions. If you remember, Biden came out and said, our sanctions are so strong, it'll end the war quickly. Uh, it hasn't ended the war. As a matter of fact, it's had the exact opposite effect on our power and prosperity throughout the world. The first thing they did, they seized $300 billion of Russian central bank capital. This is a major, major no-no. Uh, even in global economic sanctions, which has been going on since globalization began, uh, it's always been off limits to seize a central bank's cap, because all countries are essentially run by central banks. It's been, it's been taboo off limits. Now, if you look at $300 billion in Russian central bank capital, it's the equivalent of $4 trillion in US central bank capital based on economies of scale. Imagine if, imagine if a, a foreign country seized $4 trillion of our government's money, what the backlash would be. It, with this administration, it would be none. Um, but with a, a real president, a real administration, there would be severe severe consequences for that. But we did that. This woke up the rest of the world. Um, we are now at, I think the exact number is probably around 48 uh, nations that have publicly stated they will not use the US dollar for foreign trade. Uh, when this started, the economists said, oh, what a joke, uh, the, the US dollar will always be in power. Um, and they may be right. I'm not just not here to say that I'm right. I'm, I'm just concerned. Uh, I, I really don't, I, I actually hope I'm very wrong, to be honest with you. Um, in some ways. Um, now, what does this do to the US dollar? Well, right now there are trillions of dollars being held in foreign banks as a store of wealth because the US dollar is backed by the full faith and confidence of the US government, which generally meant if you were our ally and someone messed with you that we would kick their butt. Uh, we haven't kicked anyone's butt since really World War II. That's just a military fact. I have a ton of military friends and, and that doesn't make them happy, but that's the facts. Uh, I'm not here to make you happy, I'm here to share the truth. The most, recent, um, the most recent country to come out and state this is Pakistan, who six or seven days ago, Pakistan came out and announced, to, actually, I'm sorry, on Monday, Pakistan did a trade deal with Russia for more Russian oil and they paid for it in Chinese yuan, which brings up the topic of is China trying to replace, is the Chinese Yuan trying to replace the US dollar as a global reserve currency? Um, many talk about that. I can't see it happening. In order for them to do that, there's so many different steps they'd have to take. So it won't be the Yuan, but it will be an independent new created currency, most likely backed by gold. Uh, and, that, and again, I hope I'm wrong uh, in some ways. And I hope I'm right in some ways, because I think we do actually need real money in the world again, and not just fiat debt currency for a central bank that literally enslaves us through taxes. Uh, 
uh, which are going to go up. Uh, the administration and the Federal Reserve have no choice but to raise taxes. So Pakistan de-dollarized. They bought Russian oil in Chinese yuan. So let's take a look at like global affairs in China and where this is going. So China, for generations now, for about a good 30 to 40 years since China really became an economy. All right, so China is one of the original nations, around the world, one of the most history countries in the world, tons of history there. We know very little of it. Uh, but the interesting thing is that China really became a global economy about 30 years ago. Now they're competing or passing the United States. What they've been doing for the last at least 20 years is what's called soccer stadium financing. So they go to a third world country that's robust in resources, like robust. You can look at any African nation, they're all in debt to China because these African nations have tremendous natural resources that every country in the world has been using. So they go in and they say, listen, we'll build you a soccer stadium. We'll give you 20, 30, 50, $100 billion. And, uh, and we're gonna collateralize it. We're gonna collateralize it with that port over there and this swath of land. So if you, don't, if you default on your loan, no big deal. Uh, but that port is ours and that swath of land, we're going to build a military base right there. This is what's been happening around the world. Now, the United States does the same thing, but we do non-collateralized loans. So we essentially give money to a third world country and we say, hey, listen, we want to support you. And if you default on the loan, it's OK. We're just going to raise taxes on our own people and we'll cover the debt ourselves. That has been happening for a very, very long time. You can only do that so long. Imagine your own house if you just lent money to people and they defaulted on all their loans, and you just kept taking it from your children. That's what's happening in America. So we're approaching this really, really, really shady, shaky period in US economic history. But probably more importantly, uh, is the fact that we have to, in order to take this threat seriously, because I've been saying it for a while, but I don't just willy nilly throw out ideas. I generally think through them in detail and have a tremendous amount of research behind it. Here's some research for you. China, in the past year, has sold 25% of their government, uh, US government treasury holdings, 25%. Uh, what does that number mean? Well, uh, they were at $1.2 trillion in US government treasuries. $1.2 trillion of our US government debt was owned by China. That number is down to 850 billion. So what'd they do with their money? Well, uh, interesting stat about China, they're the world's number one gold producer. We really don't know how much gold the country has, but I can tell you pretty accurately, their central bank has 2,100 tons of gold. Uh, 144 tons of gold have been purchased by the Chinese central bank in the past three years. They bought 16 tons of gold last month. Uh, that total number on a central bank basis is 25% of all central banks, of all gold is owned by central banks. 25%. So if we take a look at their, just their gold holdings, right? So if we took a look at, you know, call it the, the $144 trillion or the, the 20, excuse me, 2,100 tons of gold that China has, that if you converted that into a currency with the same sort of uh, backing that, that Switzerland had back in the 80s and 90s when they had some form of gold backs, their, their currency was so strong they had to devalue it. So, because they were a little tiny country. But if you look at this huge, massive economic powerhouse in China, which is really only second to us, depending on how you look at it, uh, 2,100 tons of gold would equal a $6 trillion currency. A $6 trillion currency in circulation would make it effectively the sixth or fifth largest currency on planet Earth. I mean, those are stats you can't deny, those are facts. And along with this, we have to look at sanctioning and what it's doing. What, what, is, what is the economic sanctions that we're placing on foreign nations? What's it doing to our nation? You know, right now, a little known story that most people don't know about is in the nation of Uganda. They are actually banning uh, LGB, whatever it is. They're banning that, whatever that is. And our government is preparing to sanction Uganda economically until they adhere to Western societal values. Per every treaty that's been signed is, you know, that we've put in place as a nation is, we can get involved militarily and economically, but societally, that's on you. We're now pushing this radical gay, LGBTQ, XYZP, WX, 
four, nine dash divided, whatever it is, all the letters and numbers they want to use. Uh, we're pushing this on foreign nations and sanctioning them with the US dollar. This is a recipe for disaster. And it's a disaster that is not going to fall on the government. It's going to fall on you. So if you prepare for these things ahead of time, you will be much, much better off. So let's look beyond China, right? So if China, who is now a formal contracted ally of Russia, which is exactly what our government never wanted to see was those two economic and nuclear powerhouses put together, they are now contracted. Putin and Xi met, met about two months ago and simply stated, we're gonna do something that hasn't been done in a hundred years. That's not from me. That's a direct quote from Xi to Putin. What does this mean? So how much gold has Russia purchased? They're, they're barely behind China. They're acquired, they've been acquiring gold for 18 years. Massive, massive amounts. They've been using their US dollars to buy gold for at least the last five years. They're dumping the dollar, acquiring gold, partnering with China, who by itself has enough gold in their central bank to create a $6 trillion partially backed currency, which would essentially vaporize the need for the US dollar. Um, these are statistical facts. Um, and it's, it's astounding to me. So if we look at that happening overseas, what has our government done to fight back in this economic war? The answer is nothing. They have done absolutely, they haven't stopped the 32 nations that are laundering Russian oil. Uh, they've done nothing to deter BRICS from creating a new alternative currency that could already be valued per one nation at 16 or $6 trillion in currency. There's nothing being done. So what can we do? I've been saying it for a very long time and I'm not gonna change my stance. Uh, I believe that you should, you should own physical gold and physical silver. Uh, oil and gas investments are tremendous. Of course, there's difficult times with revenue, but the tax breaks and the multiple on sale are absolutely worth what you're gonna do. Uh, the tax savings in particular, tremendous advantage. Uh, raw land, uh, I'm not a big believer in leveraged real estate right now. Um, I am in the long run, but right now we're looking at a complete collapse of the, of the commercial real estate market uh, from COVID. You gotta remember these things take years to actually come to fruition. Once, once, they're, once they're in play, it takes years for these things to happen. The commercial real estate market is in real big trouble, um, really big trouble. I'll go through that next week uh, on, on the next uh, session that we have. Um, but I think that we're looking at, and, and again, I'm, I'm not even going to use my own words. I'll use Guy Kiyosaki came out the other day and he said, systematically and mathematically, we're looking at a collapse of a stock market, real estate market, and the currency. And it will go in that one, two, three process. Uh, I heard that, I agreed with it, but I had to do some research and call some people. And, and, I, and I, I, I see eye to eye with him on that. Uh, he's also been a big oil and, 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 and gold purchaser for a long time. But there's another thing that he purchases quite frequently. It's called Bitcoin. Uh, you know, there's, there's many people across the world that talk about cryptocurrency. Um, you know, there, there is one that's truly decentralized because you have to mine it. Everything else is kind of created by mankind. Do what you want with it. You should have some alternative currency. Um, there are many people out there who believe that this coin or that coin is going to be this or that. Um, you know, be careful for that stuff because uh, I kind of look at things the government hates. If the government said that Bitcoin is a threat to national security, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to I'm probably going to look into it further. Um, and there's other cryptocurrencies that probably have value. Uh, do your own research and, and, and talk to people, you know, that are experts. Now, I am not an expert in that field, but I believe that every person should have some gold, silver, raw land, um, uh, oil and gas investments, commodity based. Uh, and some alternative currency, whether that's a cryptocurrency or, um, you know, it's really about it. There are no gold-backed uh, securities and currencies in the world yet. Uh, but I believe we're rapidly, if nothing else, all the groundwork is laid perfectly in place uh, for the destruction of the dollar. I hope it doesn't happen. I hope I'm wrong. I hope that all the economists said I'm crazy. Uh, I hope that they're right because that's what they do for a living. I'm just, I'm just a guy in an office talking to you. Uh, but I think it's important that you understand all of these things that I've talked about, and I will summarize and then take questions. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A or raise your hand. I can do that as well. I would much rather talk to you than read your question. Um, so raise your hand. I'll be happy to speak with you. I, I really don't like uh, uh, doing monologue conversations with people. I'm, I'm here to, to think with you, uh, to be, to be a, a, a sounding board for you, I guess, in some ways, and to get new ideas from you. Um, but I want to summarize this with you. Uh, Janet Yellen talked about an economic catastrophe. I believe that's the first thing she said of any value in a very long time. 
Our federal budget is way out of control. They just authorized another $4 trillion in spending. Uh, that the only way that they can compensate for that and actually balance the budget is to raise your taxes. That's, that's a guarantee. Um, uh, we are definitely at threat of losing power globally with the US dollar. Uh, sanctions are working absolutely in the opposite direction of this, uh, maybe in the right direction. That's the thing I, I, I can't get through is I can't call these people stupid anymore. Uh, I can only call them nefarious at this point. Um, and it's very obvious from a statistical standpoint that if nothing else, foreign nations are stockpiling gold, stopping using the dollar, doing trade in foreign currencies, and our government's doing nothing about it. So that's kind of what I've got for you on a summary right now. I see your hand up, Richard, leave it up there. I'm gonna to get to you here. There's a couple of questions before you that I'll read off. Uh, how much oil from the Permian Basin is consumed in the US and how much is sold overseas? Uh, that is a great question that I will get the answer for you uh, next week. Uh, I don't know that answer off the top of my head. Uh, I will say out of the Permian, a grand majority, uh, you know, we're a pipeline, like the WTI uh, is, is generally a pipeline industry. Um, you know, you're looking at some other forms of crude, like Brent is really more uh, export driven. Most of the oil that comes out of the Permian is U.S. Con consumption. But I will, I, I, that's such a good question. I will definitely uh, uh, research that and get that information back to you, Mark. Great question. I wish I had an answer for you, but I will not make stuff up. I promise you that. Uh, I will tell you I don't know if I don't know. Uh, Dow went down today. This is David Darwin. Thank you, David. That went down today, S&P flat, NASDAQ slightly up. Welcome to the world, of the, welcome to the clown world where nothing makes sense. I've been watching this stuff for so long. It's, it's amazing how often gold, silver, and the stock market go up hand in hand. Uh, this, these non-corollary markets are moving together. Now they're, I, I said this about six months or four months ago whenever I started this. The first one I did is I said, you are watching a system short circuit itself. So the short circuit, you're gonna see a lot of anomalies, not just up till now, but moving forward until something in the system breaks. Um, but there, there is really no, no explanation for a lot of the things that are happening right now. And it kind of stinks to say that because I wish I had an answer. The answer I have, I get laughed at for saying, uh, but I will say it at the end, because I don't care if they laugh at me. Um, David, again, are there any proposals out there by Republican president, presidential candidates that makes sense? <laughs> balanced budget. Um, Oh gosh, uh, I have I have absolutely never been a Democrat. Uh, I've never voted for a Democrat. Uh, I was a Republican until I was audited by our or just had tax problems nonstop because uh, you know. Um, but uh, as far as presidential candidates, I don't believe that we've actually had a candidate. I I, I am a an avid uh, America first uh, person. Um, I do believe that America should be made great again, if that helps answer your, your question in, in a sneaky way. Uh, but no, uh, there, are, there are no, pol pol let me explain this to you. Politicians uh, don't have the, I may be wrong on this number, but I'm going to be very close to it. About 86% of Congress are multimillionaires. Uh, that's a huge number. So you have people who don't live in the normal world that are making rules for the normal person. Um, you can look at the net worth of any congressional, senatorial, uh, or even president. Here's a great, Barack Obama, uh, his net worth when he became president was like less than a half a million dollars. He was like $250,000 net worth. He's worth $150 million right now and has homes all over the world. So if you still believe that presidential candidates have your best interest in mind, I would, I would rethink that. Uh, because the, the current system in Washington is nothing more than a buffet to make themselves wealthy by convincing you they're doing the right thing. That's my opinion. You're welcome to have your own. Uh, but the facts are the facts that people go into Congress and the Senate and presidents all the time uh, as normal net worth people. And when they leave, they're worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Nancy Pelosi, another great example. What has she ever done besides working in the, Mitch McConnell, hey, let's just go to both sides. What have they ever done in the real world to make, people are both worth hundreds of millions of dollars. They didn't get there through public service. Um, so I hope that answers your question. I loved your question, by the way, David. Thank you for asking it. Um, David, on oil, I read we are starting to refill the strategic petroleum reserve at 70, $73 a barrel. Uh, we sold at $93 a barrel. Did we, the taxpayers, actually make money on this? Wow, what a good question, David. 
Um, and Richard, keep your hand up. I, I've not forgotten. I'm just trying to get through these. Um, I'm, try, I'm trying not to get our company in trouble because this will go on the King operating YouTube and not Eric. Yeah, I don't have a YouTube. I don't believe in YouTube. Um, but I will say this. The quick answer is no. We the people make zero money on government sales of energy. Zero. Uh, I will say this. I will say that I don't believe that the government, this existing administration, will ever replenish the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. When they talk about it, they talk about it from a politician standpoint. So they want to tell you we're refilling the SPR because it's pretty apparent we're probably going to war. And I'll explain that actually. That's a topic I forgot to cover. So they are basically saying, we're gonna, re all, the headline will read, government refilling SPR. If you read the fine line, it's 3 million barrels, okay? They're gonna buy 3 million barrels. They've removed 250 million barrels, but they're gonna put, so they borrowed $250 from you. They're gonna give you $3 back. That's essentially what it is, and you won't see a penny of it. Uh, the price on refilling uh, is important to oil and gas investors because when the government starts buying oil, if, if they actually really do, uh, that will set the new bottom. In pricing. But the interesting thing about this is the mere fact that your question is, did we, the taxpayers, actually make money on this? Absolutely not. You know where you haven't made money? This is a great conversation for, for King people. Here's where you haven't made money. Uh, and I challenge any of you to prove me wrong. Read the last three GDPs. Just read them. They're boring. They're tedious. They're overburdened with word salad. But if you look at the very core of it, if you remove the sale of liquid natural gas to Europe, and mind you, since November, maybe November, December of last year, uh, the price of natural gas dropped from eight or nine dollars a unit down to two twenty five here in America. But the price in Europe is twenty eight dollars. And I'm not accusing anyone of anything. But if I had all the mechanisms in the world to put out fake information to drop the price again, not making accusations. Uh, I would probably lower the price one place and then sell it, broker it to another place for more, pocket the money and say, I'm doing a great job with the economy. Read the GDP reports and you'll probably agree with me. Um, great question, David. These are all great. You guys have great questions. I hope I have decent answers for them. They're really good. Uh, there are multiple. Uh, it's from Richard. Uh, well, Richard, let's get you on here live. Richard, you are live. Unmute yourself, man. You are ready to go. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, so th there are multiple segments to the commercial real estate market, and I was intrigued by your comment about uh, a pending uh, collapse of the commercial real estate market. What segment or segments of the commercial real estate market do you see collapsing? Office office space, one hundred percent. I mean, you have a you have a government promoting work at home. By the way, work at home hasn't worked. No one works at home. Productivity is down double digit percentages for companies all around the country. So not only are the office spaces not being paid for and rented, the companies that are renting those spaces are less productive. Um, so my focus on commercial real estate, warehousing will probably get hit as well. Um, the multifamily segment, I don't see being hit as hard in the, in the, in the collapse. I see the, the multifamily spaces being killed by interest rates. You know, the construction loans that are converting from 2% to 9%, they're chewing up all the distributions. Uh, but specifically, what I'm talking about here, Richard, is really office space and some warehousing space. Thank Still you. there? Yeah, thank you. You got it, sir. Thank you. Great question. Thank you for uh, having me nail that down and clarify. Not a blanket statement. You know, if we look at multifamily, the interest rates will affect multifamily space. But the one thing that is apparent, uh, number one, is that rents will go up. So in order, if the interest rates are going to be higher on adjusted loans, then the landlords are going to raise the rent, obviously. And there's already a gigantic movement in this country of people who are, who are uh, re-domesticating or they're, they're moving in with other people to share expenses. So I think the multifamily will be hit very lightly as opposed to office space and warehousing. Great question, though, Richard. All right, next one is from Keith uh, Wilkinson. Given our government and much of our leftist uh, public is delusionally <laughs> ESG and anti-fossil fuel, what are the regulatory and systematic risks uh, to oil and gas investing? Tremendously awesome question, Keith. Um, let me break this down in a couple of ways. So number one, the entire ESG movement is nothing more. 
uh, I'll challenge you all to look up something. I think it's called the CEI, which is a corporate index of how woke you are. Um, ESG is just another way of saying how woke you are. Uh, ESG is not actually a mathematical equation to make the planet better. It is a new religion that people believe in. The largest purveyor of ESG or the brute force brown shirt that's enforcing it upon every company known to man, uh, including technology companies that really don't admit that much carbon. Um, if we look at ESG for what it is, it's a new tax. It's just another way of taxing everyone for a, a complete falsehood. ESG's biggest purveyor or their brown shirt, their bully is BlackRock. BlackRock is also the number one acquirer of oil fields. So for generate probably longer than any of us have been alive, the powers that be tell one story over here to lower the price of property or value and then they buy it over here. This is, there's nothing new under the sun, Keith. There never has been. Uh, ESG is a great way to put good businesses out of business, buy them cheap and revamp them. Uh, it's also another great way to tax people into oblivion and convince them that the world is going to end in seven years. I've got a great thing in my phone if you want to see it. I can give you every decade, every new environmental thing. I think it was the 70s. They said, said we'd run out of oil by the 70s. You know, we, I just went to an oil, our oil field yesterday and saw oil. Um, so that didn't happen. Uh, uh, Al Gore told us we wouldn't have beaches anymore, that all the ice caps, would, this is the best part. I, I, by the way, I will, I'll be happy to do an entire green myth hour long presentation for you because it just, to me, it might as well be Saturday Night Live, um, when Saturday Night Live was funny before ESG standards. Um, ESG and all these things, we heard the beaches would disappear because the, because the glaciers would melt. So my kids came to me and said this know, like six years ago because they were in school and they said, you know, the glaciers are going to melt and this new, all the water is going to create a flood. And I said, okay, let me, let me do something with you. I went and got a glass of water. I filled it, a glass, I filled it with ice and then I filled it with water. And we sat there until all the ice melted and not a single drop overflowed, not a single drop overflowed out. So the ice can melt, but it doesn't necessarily mean you'll have a flood. Um, and I think people are starting to see this, the ESG stuff. I mean, there's different beliefs. I don't believe ESG will be a thing in three to four years. I think we'll have to suffer through it until uh, there's a change in power and truth is actually told to the world. Uh, one of the funniest things that I've seen is that some brave uh, media person in Scotland actually went undercover to a wind farm. I, I've got so many good wind farm stories. Uh, went undercover to a wind farm in Scotland and the news actually covered it. I can send you all the clip if you'd like. Uh, they went to a wind farm in Scotland that completely destroyed a farm. Like they, they, they bought out these farmers at, at very, you know, pennies on the dollar for their farmland and put up wind farms. And these wind farms, 80% of them were being run on diesel generators. So the wind, the windmill wouldn't turn on its own. So they actually hooked it up to a diesel generator to make it circulate. Uh, I was just at, in, in, in Borden County at, in the Permian Basin literally yesterday. Uh, I took a picture. I took a picture of our oil rig, which is, is actually getting some oil. We're getting a lot of water out, but we're getting oil. Uh, but I took a picture of our rig, and in the backdrop on this property is a bunch of windmills. Not a single windmill turned for the two hours we were on site. Not a single turn, not even a small rotation. So it's a great picture to say one of these two things actually produces energy. Um, and this stuff is becoming redundant. So uh, the, the hard part about understanding uh, things like ESG and how stupid it is is the time that you have to wait for the rest of the world to catch up to you. And unfortunately, I think that the new religion of green politics and ESG, uh, I don't think it's going anywhere. Um, I, think, I think it's a religion. I think those people are gonna believe this till they're dying. I think they're gonna believe that the beaches will disappear next year and that uh, we'll have you know, impending doom from this and that that never comes to fruition. It's just a great way to extort money. Uh, that's what our government is. It's a mafia that finds a way to create fear in your life so you pay them to fix the problem. ESG is basically saying the world is coming to an end. We have to raise your taxes and make it more expensive for you to do business so that we have the money so that we can solve the problem. But remember, the people who are asking for your money get 40% of your income and they're $35 trillion of debt. Uh, eventually, the rest of the world will see that. Great question, Keith. I hope I answered your question accurately. Um, got any more hands raised? Again, I'd love to talk to you. I don't generally like to read your answers. I love talking to people. I'll get you in just one second. Thank you, Christy. Um, oh, took her hand down. Christy, raise your hand again. Uh, Gary, are you concerned with 
current economic conditions. Uh, if I can stop your sentence there, the answer is yes. Uh, current economic conditions as to your projected returns and the setbacks that you've had in regards to your oil fund. Uh, again, these are educational workshops about macroeconomics. Uh, I generally stay away from talking about, I'll do that with you one-on-one -on -one or in a, uh, another workshop with Justin. This will be published on, on YouTube, so I don't want to get too into that. Um, am I concerned with the uh, economic conditions affecting our projections? Yeah, of course. Um, I just explained to you that every time oil goes up, all of a sudden we have a miracle new supply and it keeps pushing the price down. Um, the setbacks we've had, we've corrected. The things that we can control, I think we've done a great job controlling and we're getting better at it every day. Um, but as any, any person that works here or any person who's ever invested in oil and gas, uh, price is always the biggest risk. Um, so yes, I, I, I am concerned uh, that economic conditions uh, in the price area will affect us. I, I, I don't see when the world finally goes, hey, we're in a recession. I've known we're in a recession. We've been in a recession for over a year. When the world admits it, you know, if, in every recession we've seen across the history, uh, the price of oil and gas dips uh, because the way that they get rid of inflation is to create unemployment. That, that, like this, the whole system is broken. Um, so am I I'm always concerned that economic conditions will affect my business. Uh, always and every every person who who operates, runs, works at a company should always be concerned. Uh, but I'm not concerned in the long run uh, of how our fund will turn out. Temporary setbacks exist, but good teams get through them pretty easily um, with a lot of hard work. So great question, Gary. I'll be happy to uh, have a conversation with you one on one. But again, this is going to go on YouTube and I don't want to burden YouTube with with the stuff that we're talking about in the fund. Um, good stuff. Um, David, you're very welcome. Uh, Terry, uh, yeah, I'm not planning to start a podcast. I actually, this is all, this is what I did. Uh, but I talked about the three things you never should before I worked at King. Uh, I had a podcast, which I, I still do every now and then on Telegram. Uh, but I am taking it into the formal podcast iTunes arena here. I don't know. I'm just so busy with work. Uh, I'm hoping to in the next month. Uh, and when I do, we'll certainly let all of you know so that we can do this. I just have to, I had to bring in a few people to take some stuff off my plate so I'd have time to do that because we've, we've grown massively in the last year. Uh, and that's kind of goes back to the last question. So it, it, would I be concerned about economic conditions and the success of our fund six months ago? Maybe, uh, but we now have the people we need in place that are very good at what they do. Um, and when I can free myself up, Terry, I definitely am going to reboot my podcast um, and do it more often. Uh, it's therapeutic for me and I, I hope helpful for other people. Uh, Keith, I agree with all you say, but I could, uh, I could see our government would impose taxes and regulations even more selectively than they already do. I agree. Additional taxes, specific taxes on fossil fuel investing, um, special regulations to curtail production. Uh, these are the kind of risks that I'm asking about. Great questions. Um, so the special taxes being uh, imposed on fossil fuel investing is, is the right way to think of it in reverse. So we have a tremendous tax advantage, 100% uh, write-off combined for over your period of history, depending on how you come into the fund. Um, that is already in process of being reduced. So they won't assess a special, they won't tax you for investing in oil and gas, they'll just reduce the tax write-off that you get. And that's already in the works. So 2023 is kind of the last real good year to get into this unless something changes, because it'll drop, you know, five, 10% next year. It'll still be a better write-off than you can find anywhere else. Uh, but the, the tax, they are already attacking that. I, I shortened that up. Um, specific taxes on, on uh, fossil fuel investing. I don't like the term fossil fuel. It's not just from dinosaurs. It's just old trapped carbon um, with heat and pressure. Uh, special regulations to curtail production, uh, that's already happening on federal land. So they've already eliminated about 25% of the industry by, by shutting down federal land leases. However, the American people are very distraught and angry, and they've started to open some of that back up. Uh, now, I'm not a doomist. I, you know, this idiot we have in office, and sorry if you voted for him, sorry, not sorry, because um, I don't think you actually voted for him. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you can say that on YouTube now, actually. Um, but in the in the same breath, I will tell you that they, there's this country will have no choice. The the oil we're buying from Venezuela is so dirty, it's so expensive to refine. It's going to jack up the price of gasoline. Uh, for those of you who don't know, gasoline and how it works, for, we we produce oil in 42 gallon drums. Uh, out of that 42 gallons, they'll produce about 20 to 22 gallons of gasoline. So you need a, and a lot of petroleum crude to create gasoline. 
Um, but Keith, uh, those are those are certainly concerns, but they're not things that we need to be afraid of. We already know they're coming on the tax reduction. Uh, as far as new special regulations to curtail production, we haven't seen that yet. And there's really nothing that I've personally seen on the docket in DC. Uh, towards they have much bigger fish to fry at this point in time, but it's certainly a concern that we're paying attention. It's part of my job is to pay attention to those things. But definitely like the way you're thinking, Keith. Um, and from Terry. Uh, Terry, I thought you had your hand up. Um, have you read about small micronuclear reactors as an alternative to wind and solar for electrical power generation? Absolutely have. I actually come from the quantum space. Um, so for me, I understand um, uh, subatomic energy, which is the future of the world. It, it truly is. Um, the interesting thing about uh, small, because you're talking about small fusion reactors. Uh, one thing that I can never get out of my mind is if you read President Trump's last executive order as president, it was the authorization for use of small fusion reactors, uh, which people haven't talked about in probably five or 10 years. So um, I have definitely read, I'm, I'm well-versed in that. I think that's where the, where the future of energy will go. Um, but until then, there is no bridge. We, we will go from, from, from oil, and ga oil, gas, and coal to nuclear if we actually concern ourselves with the planet, because nuclear is clean energy. There, there is no carbon emission from nuclear. The only carbon emission that comes from nuclear is the carbon emissions that occur when you build the plant. Um, and this green energy hoax is, is ridiculous. You know, it takes 800, 600 to 800 gallons of oil to make a battery for an electric vehicle. By the way, those batteries are creating uh, massive amounts of, of electromagnetic fields and radiation. So people are sitting on something that's radiating beneath them. Uh, you can probably, you'll probably see colon and prostate cancer increase from that, is my guess. Um, but if you look at the whole grand scope of these things, in order to build a, an electric vehicle, which has zero emissions, uh, mining the materials and building the components and assembling the vehicle, you've already emitted 13 years of full driving potential. So every electric vehicle that's on the road today uh, has already emitted 13 years of full driving capabilities. Um, very, very good question, Terry. Thank you very much. I will wrap it up by saying this. I try to stay economic, but I, I, I do want to, this has gone a little bit over my, my time frame, an hour, an hour and two minutes to try to keep it under it, but I did forget to cover this. I think it's important to note that when we're talking about money or investing or economics, oil and gas, all these other things, it's important to understand that the geopolitical environment and the environment around the world doesn't matter where, look what's happening in Uganda that will affect your life. Um, if uh, it's going to push many countries over the edge and say, why are you penalizing this country for not buying into LGB, whatever? Because um, it's none of our business. Uh, they have every right to run their country whatever way they want to socially. Absolutely. But it's important to know that we're approaching a very dangerous period in history. If we look at our three biggest allies that we have combined forces with from the United States and used our military might to create safety and comfort in theirs, we have to look at Europe. Korea and Japan. These are three nations that for the better part of the last 60 years have reduced, significantly reduced their military might because of their partnerships with us. Now, until Trump was in office, we were doing the same thing. So at that same time, China was doubling down on military. Russia was, Russia's military capabilities are pretty impressive for a, a relatively small economic nation big in landmass, big in resources, decent population, but you know, not China, the US. So in the middle of this period in history, we find ourselves and we have Japan, very strong ally. They have reduced their military capabilities, depending on us. Korea has done the same. You're now seeing rockets fired from North Korea all over the place. Japan and South Korea are direct pathway of North Korea. You have the EU, all the, all, all the European nations have basically said, you know what? Uh, we'll spend our money on other things. We'll, we'll line our pockets with taxpayer money in another way instead of spending it on the military um, because the U.S. has our back. Um, when you start sanctioning nations that surround them, you destabilize uh, territories. So right now, our sanctions against Russia, which have created a partnership with China, have put our strongest allies in direct destabilized areas economically and militarily. And I don't know how to fix these problems. I'm not a problem, just a guy in an office talking to you. I don't know how to fix these problems, but I certainly see them. I certainly understand uh, where what could happen. 
Um, I try not to be too detailed in that because uh, the next session I'm going to talk to you about CBDCs and digital currencies and all these other things, they're all part of the same system, the same plan. And if we look at the real danger in the world, we have people talking about nuclear war. We have, we have reduced the, the, the military might of our three strongest allies. While we, were, we just gave, a, we have next to no ammunition in our military. We've given it all to Ukraine. You know, we've given $200 billion in support, about $50 billion in cash and $150 billion in military equipment and ammunition. We left $86 billion worth of ammunition and military equipment in Afghanistan. That is literally a quarter of a trillion dollars or more of equipment and military might that we no longer have. And our three strongest allies, the EU, Japan, and Korea, have weakened militaries that are depending on ours if by a long shot you know, 10 years ago if russia and china teamed up and if they could figure out a way to de-dollarize uh, then they would be able to dominate and control those areas um, the entire when people talk about taiwan all the I, taiwan's probably going to go to china eventually uh, they have, they do have what's called the silicon shield they produce so much of the world's microchips it's not like you're going to bomb the country because uh, you destroy, the, the microchip is more valuable than gold right now uh, with, with after COVID, it really is. Um, but I think it's important to note that the actions of this administration have destabilized very secure regions around the world that have tremendous economic ties to the United States. So I kind of in summary, great questions. Number one, thank you. Um, I will never say you have a stupid question. Uh, I probably have a stupid answer. So next time from here on out, please feel free to raise your hand and just talk with me. I, it gets lonely in here just talking by myself. Um, but I think it's important to note that not only is economic um, uncertainty very available in the world, uh, but uncertainty around the world is almost guaranteed at this point. So uh, make sure you're doing the right things to protect your family. Lower your taxes any way you can. Try to find tax-free income anywhere you can. That's why it's why it's literally why I work here. Um, you know, drilling oil is hard. We're getting really good at it. Uh, we're growing in size, and we're excited about the future. But make sure make sure you're 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 heeding some of this advice because if I'm wrong, there's really no downside to having gold and silver and. And then raw land and investments in oil and gas, it's not going to end your life, um, but not having it in economic, economic uncertainty may. So uh, lower your taxes, uh, try to find as many stores of value as you can for, for your cash. Uh, love your families, praise God, um, you know, go to church, you know, make sure you're doing all the right things. This, at the end of the day, all of this stuff boils down to a spiritual war anyway. Um, but each and every one of you, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, thank you for, for, for being part of the, the King family. Thank you for listening in today. Uh, I hope I've provided some value to you. That truly is the, the only, only intention I have with these things. Um, and I look forward to speaking with you next week. We will start doing these weekly. Um, and just feel free to reach out to whoever you're connected with here at the company and send them topics that you're confused about. I, I probably am too. Uh, and it'll allow me and the people I, I do research with to, to kind of dig through things and see if we can make sense of it. Um, the best that we can do in this crazy world we find ourselves in is to be good people, uh, to, to, to work with each other, to help one another, and try to help each other understand what's happening around us. Uh, and then things will change. Things will get better. Things will, This time, like all other times, uh, will also pass. So God bless you all. Thank you so much for coming today. I look forward to seeing you next week uh, once again. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week and an even better weekend.